Okay. Go. Okay. Please welcome Daniel Domscheit Berg, who is going to talk about. Um, it, uh, it's called um, Beyond Our Own Noses. Your presentation. Yes. Yes. There you go. Uh, thank you. So uh, welcome everybody. I think a few more people are dropping in, so just uh, find a, find a seat or so somewhere. Uh, thanks for coming by. So um, my, the title for this presentation might be a bit uh, meta, so to say. Uh, Beyond our own no noses, um, context to an ongoing revolution. Um, from where I stand, actually, I would have done it quite a bit differently right now because it's not really an ongoing revolution as it is an upcoming revolution. So if you have been here yesterday, Anders has already been talking about you know, some of the changes that we are facing. Uh, most, of, most of that, I think, is uh, stuff we should be really concerned about. I have a few disagreements maybe about uh, some other parts, but um, I want to try to approach this whole topic from a little bit of a different perspective. So um, I think you all know about some of the developments that are happening, but I think what helps, at least to me and uh, maybe also to you, is uh, to have context um, about these kinds of developments that we are reading about every day that are part of, I don't know, the work we are doing and all of that. And um, I'd actually like to talk a little bit about this context so that maybe uh, it helps to understand some of the mechanics of what's going on and also we can understand a little bit better what our role in the current time is. So I have uh, only have a few slides. Um, this is number one of three. Um, this is a good picture to kind of show wha what is happening right now. Uh, it's, it's a picture that was taken when the railroad was introduced and it is this desperate guy on the horse that is trying to catch up with uh, the railroad. And um, it shows a lot of things uh, that we should be concerned about today. And most of all, it is change that is happening. And this is a revolution because it is turning things upside down. It's not just changing things a little bit, but uh, I want to show you in uh, the course of this presentation that we are actually, let's say, facing um, a revolution in society that is really going to change the way that we live, the way our society is working. And uh, I believe that is a good thing. So maybe a similar disclaimer to Anders. I'm an optimist. I, I love technology, and I think a lot of this can solve so many problems that we are seeing today. And I think it is our responsibility to make sure it's solving these problems and not just adding new ones. So, but we're going to get to that. So, um, most of the slides will look like this, so you're not distracted. And I'll try to catch you or capture you in a story about all of that. So let's begin maybe with the most generic uh, statement I want to make. And this is a statement about evolution. So. In order to understand what's, what's going on today, it might help to think about the following. It took about two billion years uh, in the course of the evolution on this planet to create life. And within these two billion years, it's about six million years that it took in order to create uh, the hominid, so the human ape, which is the basis for what we are today. And then it's another 100,000 years roundabout that it took to create human life as we know it today. That's what we are out of that development. So this is how biological evolution works. And it's similar if you look at technological evolution, for example. There's a similar pattern. So it's maybe 10,000 years that we are speaking about for the agricultural revolution. Then it's around 400 years for the scientific revolution. And then it's another 150 years, for example, for the first industrial revolution. Now, why does that matter? It, it matters because it shows us there's a, that there's kind of an underlying pattern in how things change. And that is that the time frames in which change are happening are becoming shorter. And when we are speaking about what's going on today in a little bit, uh, this time frame that we are facing is, uh, this is a serious challenge for us today. We are not built neither biologically, nor do we have systems in society, let's say political systems, for example, to cope with this accelerated speed in which new things coming up uh, are disrupting society or are changing things around us. And we have to find a strategy to deal with this. 
But let's stick with this first industrial revolution for a second, because I think this is also a very important concept. So uh, this slide, number two of three, uh, is actually showing something about industrial revolutions. So first of all, they always go like this. Um, uh, you can always see this kind of a curve. Um, an industrial revolution will start very small, and at some stage it will get very much accelerated, and then it will peak, and then it will slow down a little bit and drop out somehow. And then you have these overlaps, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit as well. You have these overlaps where one industrial revolution is kind of overlapping with the next one. Now, what is an industrial revolution? So, as a first thought experiment, try to imagine that you are born maybe 600, 650 years ago. So, imagine a world in which uh, it is only a very small group of people, mostly people belonging to the Catholic Church, or people born into some kind of uh, privileged families or so that have access to the right to learn how to read and write. And then suddenly, 600 years ago, roundabout, some kilometers south from here in Mainz, a guy has this crazy idea of building a machine that could print books and that would take the privilege of creating books out of the hands of very few people. And what he does is he starts kind of a very early crowdfunding campaign. He's uh, going around trying to find investors that believe in this idea. Similar as on Kickstarter, he's selling this idea, this vision that he has. And he finds some people that believe in the, in the potential of such a machine. And then he creates that machine, backed by some people, and it takes a few years until the machine is finished. And then suddenly he goes off and he prints the first Bibles. Now, not a lot has changed other than a machine printing Bibles the same way that other people have hand-copied Bibles before. But something else changes. Suddenly there is a machine. And suddenly many other people that have other thoughts, that have other interests, maybe, than copying Bibles, they have the means to have these ideas printed on paper and distributed. So this is a communications revolution. It's similar as disruptive or you, however you want to call that. I don't really like that word much either, but it describes a lot what's happening. So that technology is suddenly disrupting this privilege, this, uh, this power that a few people had, and suddenly this is democratized in a way. Suddenly more people get access to the means of copying books and actually writing down ideas. And that's important because it's not only the ability to print a book, but it is way more than that. It is, for example, also the privilege to decide what is actually being written down at all. If you're the only one who can write, then you have the privilege to decide what is being written down. And what you write down is what you deliver down to further generations coming after you. So you are actually in the position to decide what is history and what isn't. And you're also not just deciding that, but you're also deciding with what kind of an interpretation things are written down and copied and kept for future generations. So I think it is impossible to imagine the situation before the printing press was, was invented. But if we try to figure out what the Internet is doing today, this is a very good thought experiment, because the Internet is another such communications revolution that is really changing the game. And that is kind of, at least I'm a network engineer, and if it all turns out very nicely, that can change this game completely. Because it's going to be just as different today or in the next few years as it was back then when the printing press was invented. So what happens is that with this, a hierarchy is being reduced. More people get access to information, and if you have more access to information, you can broaden your horizon, you can look over the border of your... You, you can look beyond your own nose. That's, I think, the proper English translation. So after this printing press is, is invented, we can see that, for example, we have uh, the scientific revolution coming up, people having ideas about science, being able to communicate to one another, communicate these ideas, 
we can see that uh, we are entering the, um, uh, the age of Martin Luther, for example. The only way that Martin Luther could question the whole system of the world is by having access to a printing press. And I think it's, there's nothing more radical anybody a few hundred years ago could have done than question this existing system of the world and having an alternative explanation for why things are the way they are. So this is as radical as it could be. Now, the printing press is only, as you can see here, is only one of three parts. And an industrial revolution, at least this is the explanation uh, that, that I read and that seemed to be very, uh, very conclusive to me, is made out of two other, or I in total a three part revolutions. And the two other ones are a revolution in energy production and the third one is a revolution in logistics. So if we can, maybe you had that in, uh, in your, uh, um, in your history classes or so at school, when suddenly a few hundred years after the printing press, the steam engine was invented, suddenly all these printing presses could be powered by a steam engine, and then suddenly the steam engine could also power a railroad network that was being constructed, and that was the basis for all this knowledge being written down to be delivered all over Europe, and this was the basis basically for a first industrial revolution. Now, the first industrial revolution, it changed everything. It, it was what created the first factories. It was what made all the work people were doing manually kind of redundant suddenly because it could be done in a factory. But it also required other changes, other revolutions in society, for example, a social revolution. One of the things we can see that were introduced in that time are also, for example, health insurance and regulation to protect workers and regulation to prevent children from being forced to labor in these f early factories. So we can see that these industrial revolutions are also accompanied by social revolutions, or at least they ideally have to be, because it's not just technology that is, is changing, but it is also the social environment that is being heavily influenced by this. And if we cannot come up today with an, a, a social revolution to accompany this industrial revolution we are seeing, then I think we are facing some of the problems that Anders has been um, addressing last night. So let's fast forward a little bit into the 20th century where we have another industrial revolution. This time it's electronic communication, so the radio, television, the telephone, all kinds of media that suddenly turn up outside of the realm of books that help people to broaden their horizons, to look beyond their own noses, to come up with innovative ideas, to inspire each other, all of that. And it's fossil fuels, and it's not just a very broad network of railroads, but it's a very narrow network of streets that are being built that can uh, are the basis for cars traveling, and again, the cars bringing all this knowledge into the far, far corners of this world. And today, if we fast forward a little bit, we are kind of at this intersection here where this second industrial revolution that at least I was still born into is kind of fading out and with the internet and the advent of computers we are seeing a third industrial revolution on the horizon. Now a lot of the topics that we are speaking about today are part of this new future that, that will change the dynamics and the fabric of society in a way I think we can't really imagine today. So I was born in 1978 um, my father, for example, he was working in an insurance company at that time and he was starting to raise a small family and my father and my mother were thinking about constructing their own home. And then in the mid-70s, my father was approached in his company by his superior and his superior said, we have this crazy idea for an insurance company that we could build a small data center and we could buy a mainframe and we could see if a mainframe is something that will be of value to insurance companies in the future. So will insurance companies need computers? This was a question that was totally radical 40 years ago. And my father, for him, this was a decision that would influence the whole rest of his career. It would, it would influence if he could make the payments for the home he is just about to construct or he wants to construct. 
he was planning to have a family. So 40 years ago, this very fundamental decision, if computers make any sense at all, was totally new in society. At least in the commercial field, the uh, military is always, as we heard as well yesterday, and that's another issue, but the military is always a few years earlier. But in the commercial sector, 40 years ago, this was the decision to be taken. My father left work two years ago and went into his pension. And he went into his pension at the time when this same insurance company was talking about how to make use of artificial intelligence uh, technology to actually get rid of people doing all the work of, for example, insurance brokers. So within this one period, this one period of, uh, of, uh, of a working life, a major step forward has been done. It has changed so radically that the world my father knew when he went into this company is not the world anymore that my father faced when he left that same company. And that's something I'd like to... I have this one graph. It might be from Gartner. I'm not entirely sure. It might be some other analysts, but it's helping us to understand this, this kind of a situation. So what you can see here in these lines, I hope you can even see that the screen might be a bit small, but what we can see here is this is a, a, time, um, a timeline from 1900 up to sometime today, or even in the future. The green bar here is the life expectancy of people. And uh, all these lines present various technologies that have been introduced into society and the time frame it takes until they are adapted in more than 90% of all the households. So. If you were born in 1903 and uh, you, were, you were born in a time when the telephone was introduced, then until the telephone has reached 90% of all the households, 73 years went by. This is more than the life expectancy at that time. So people at that time had more than one lifetime to adapt to the new technology of the telephone, which really makes a complete difference if you have a telephone compared to not having a telephone. But the more we look over here, uh, the more these lines go into a vertical. Now, another thought experiment maybe, uh, at least I can remember, I'm not sure for some of you, but try to remember how your life was before you had a smartphone. Not only a mobile phone, but a smartphone that is offering all these other channels, just not a telephone. Imagine what life at work was like and also what life in your personal realm was like. It's a complete game changer. The way we communicate, the way we organize with one another, the way we are reachable and what that all means for our private lives, for our working environments and all of that, it has com been completely turned upside down by this one technology presented in a smartphone. The smartphone is uh, somewhere here, so it started in 2007. It's this line. It's just a vertical. It went from 2010 to maybe 2012 or so. It, it took two, three, four years, something like that, in order to reach 90% of all the households in the United States. So I have to say that this is not true for the third world, and it's not true for other parts of our world, but it is true for what we call the developed world and let's say the reality we all are living in. So this is one disruptive, very disruptive technology that is changing everything for us. And we had a few years, less than one handful of years to adapt to this. And it's not gonna be the last one, but there's gonna be many other things that are gonna be adapted so fast that we actually we have a real challenge in order to, to cope with this. And that's something we have, to, we have to deal with and we have to come up with strategies to do that. And I think the first thing is that we have to realize that it is kind of our responsibility in our time to deal with this. And it's not just our generation, but it is, to me at least, especially this community. Because most of us, we understand that in contrast to my parents, for example, or all kinds of other people I'm speaking to that have no clue about technology and that don't know what is coming for them. So I think we have a bit of a special uh, uh, 
a special kind of responsibility here. But I'll get to back to that a little bit, uh, in a little bit. So I mentioned I was born in 1978. I got my first, uh, my first, let's say, technical environment sometime in the mid 80s. So I'm not sure. Do you know Fischer Technik up here in Denmark? Yeah. So I was a Fischer Technik kid when I was in elementary school. I had lots of Fischer Technik, and I was building conveyor belt systems in my pe in my room at home. And if you had asked me in the time of my elementary school what my future would, was like and why I go to school, why I am eager to learn, then I would have told you that conveyor belt systems are the future. That's actually what is, I was trying to tell my parents all day long. I was not just the technician of these conveyor belts, but I was also the salesman trying to tell my parents that if they give me permission to build more conveyor belts, belts around the house, that it could really ease their lives and that it, it, they could really benefit from this technology in a way they can't even imagine. So I was doing this, let's say, mechanical work, engineering work, for most of my early childhood, and then suddenly, in 1986, at the age of eight, I was very privileged to be awarded a Commodore C64 for my birthday. So my father, who was in computers, as I told you, he taught me how to program in BASIC, and then suddenly, for a few years, I dove into this world of BASIC. I was in my elementary school only one of five kids in the whole school who had seen a computer at that stage and who had access to a computer. And I started to program, and then suddenly, at the age of 10 in 1988, for Christmas, I received Fischer Technik Computing. Not sure if you remember that. It was a robot arm that you could build that had an interface to the Commodore C64. So as a 10-year-old kid, growing up in a very rural area where only five other friends of mine had the possibility to even use a computer, I was sitting in my room and I had built a robot that I could program and that I could employ at the conveyor belt. And it took about half a year to program that robot before I realized that I had lost my job because now suddenly the robot was doing all the work at the conveyor belt and it could, all the stuff I had to do manually could kind of be automized. Now, looking back, naturally this is a bit of a romanticism that I have here, but I think there is a bit of a lesson in this, in this early, in this early, um, in this early uh, experience I made. For me, if I look back today, and I've, if I'm wondering if automation and robotization is a good thing, or if this is a bad thing, then I think I ri didn't really lose anything. Sure, I, I lost this job at my conveyor belt system, but I was, opened, I was opened up a new world, which allowed me to be way more creative, which also catered way more to the potential that I have, for example. Uh, which limited me less, but it opened up many more things. And it actually also meant that I spent less time inside and I spent more time again outside. So I think, looking back, that it kind of freed me from hanging out at my conveyor belt system all day long. And to me, if we today look at automation, if we look at robotization and all of these topics, I think, ideally, this is the perspective we can take. So, I, I agree, for some people this might not be the case. But then again, for some of the technologies I want to speak about next, I think for many of these we, can, we could potentially at least agree that people have something better to do than that. So what are the technologies today and in the future that are going to change things so that you could really call it a revolution? So there's a few technology ad technologies I'd like to discuss. It's uh, generally, uh, there's probably way more. A few of them have been addressed yesterday, but I think there's a few things, a few key technologies that can be good examples for how the world is changing. And one of them, for sure, is 3D printing. So I'm not sure how many of you are involved in 3D printing or actually interested in this. Uh, most of you will know that there's a few 3D printers around this place. You will have seen an Ultimaker or a RepRap or whatever has been around this community for a very long time. But 
beyond what we do here, there's a whole new world of productivity and production actually that is opening up. So we can not only print, uh, let's say, plastic materials these days, but if you, if you go to China, for example, they are printing whole houses. This is a trend that has started in China and it is taking, for example, Dubai by storm. Yeah, so 3D printers that are large enough so they can print walls and they can print full houses and they can do that in a very meaningful manner. So in China, two years ago, they showed a showcase where 10 houses were printed in 24 hours and the material that was used was grinded down houses. So they took old houses that were torn down the material was grinded very small, it was um, recycled in some way, and then they printed new houses out of that. So what they can do, first of all, is that they can print structures. You know that from the 3D printing we see in this community. You can print structures that you couldn't construct otherwise. So from uh, a static, st statics, I hope you call it static, but from the angle of how a house is made and how it can withhold a, a storm, for example, we can come up with structures that are totally new and that you couldn't do in any other of the old-fashioned traditional ways how you would build a house. You can also do this very cheaply. One of the houses, uh, the houses that were printed in this showcase had a price of around 5,000 euros. So uh, if you look at housing crisis for refugees all over Europe, you can't really buy ship containers anymore. I'm not sure if you know that, but the ship containers are all sold out because we have to make uh, temporary housing for refugees out of that. So what about the technology being applied to something like this? What about people still living in cardboard boxes somewhere in slums all over the world? What does it mean if we can print houses that can withstand uh, a storm rated as a storm category 8 or so with a 3D printer for very cheap money? This is a huge potential. In Dubai, they have just announced that they want to print 25% of all the new constructions in Dubai, and probably you know that Dubai is building like crazy. They want to print 25% of all the new constructions until 2030. This is like in 13 years from now. This is just around the corner. There are plans for 3D printers that will print uh, the foundation of a house and it will print the first floor and then the printer will move up on the outer edges of the house and it will print another floor and then it will just continue until it has printed all the floors that are supposed to be there including most of the interior at least the rough parts and then it will just roll down on the outside of the houses again and it will go to the next construction site. In the Museum of the Future in Dubai, they printed a house as a showcase as well, and it involved just one person, one builder, a guy that was just basically m maintaining the printing machine. If we look at other parts, we can print metal today, especially in, in uh, the aerospace industry and, and airline production or so. Lots of really specialized parts are being printed in metal. We can print glass, we can print ceramics, and we can we start to print biological organisms. So today you can also build already print blood vessels. And then there's about 10 years or so until at least, hopefully, I think, we will see the first transplantable organ being printed. So the first liver, because it's the most, uh, the first heart, sorry, the, the, mo the simplest of all the organs we have about 10 years until we can see that coming from a 3D printer. So I have an uncle who suffered from a liver disease um, and he had to have a transplanted organ. And it was a really hard time and he was on this long waiting list. Maybe you know somebody that is on a waiting list for a transplantable organ. We are leaving this world within the next 10, 15 years or so. And to me, as a technology optimist, this is the greatest thing. I mean, how great would it be if anybody that is suffering from such a disease, if anybody that needed a replacement, not, you know, uh, voluntarily cutting their arms off to get, uh, to get the, 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 uh, the replacement arm because it's much stronger or so, but people that actually require that because they suffer from a disease or from an illness. How great could this future be if this would not underlie a natural scarcity anymore.
How great would it be if we could ha everybody could have access to that? And this is a very important thing to understand. We are also entering a world of zero marginal cost. I hope you know what that means. It means that basically an invention once is very, um, very expensive or at least to some extent expensive. But to then use that, the cost becomes very marginal and it goes towards zero. This is what digital is all about. No, the whole debate we had about copyright in the last decades or so is about this zero marginal cost because we can all have the same film, we can all have the same audio file or so without taking it from somebody. We can reproduce it at a cost that is kind of basically zero. And that same, that same law, that same dynamic will go for organs we can transplant. This is the copyright question. You know, we're entering a time where a transp transplantable organ will basically only be the knowledge about how to arrange zeros and ones so that that arrangement represents a transplantable organ. But who owns that knowledge? What do we as a society actually see who should be owning that? Would we agree that there should be something like, uh, like a non-natural scarcity, an artificial scarcity, just because somebody comes up with a patent for that? Or just because somebody decides that they keep this knowledge to themselves without opening it up so that everybody could use it? And the copyright debate is one of the, the best examples for a complete failure in our generation. We're still in Germany, we had a debate about Leistungsschutzrecht, that's what you called it. It was a few media companies, the ones that actually should be having that kind of a discussion, push this kind of discussion into the realm of the public. That's what the media is supposed to do, confront us with topics that are important. These companies were arguing with Google because Google was in Google News was showing an excerpt of the news stories and they said, oh, you're taking the value from our news story and you're not giving us money for that. So now we have a few media companies that ha have actually successfully uh, been excluded from Google News. I don't even on an on a economic level don't even see how that makes sense you know, to, to go out there because that is what is attracting people to read your news stories. But then again, this is, the, this is the, the ground on which we are having a copyright debate in Germany. We are arguing about bits and pieces of a news story where on the horizon we can already see that copyright will be a matter of life and death. And we don't have that debate. And that's the generic problem of today, is that we lack this debate, because this debate is actually only possible in a window of opportunity. This is, to come back to that slide, this is here. You know, this is the window of opportunity. Because in a few years' time, this will go so fast that there's no time to actually have a discussion about what kind of an environment we want to see these new technologies in. Another example, go moving away from 3D printing, take autonomous driving. You know, I think this is the, the best thing that could be happening to us. You know, I, I hate spending time in a car. You know, sometimes, I agree, riding a motorcycle is a great thing because it's, and it makes sense to actually repair an old motorcycle, I think, because, coming back to the talk of yesterday, because I think you're learning something by that. And you are actually doing something that, that challenges your, your, your skill or so. And you're not sitting on a couch watching a stupid TV channel or so, but you're doing something that where you learn something, where you broaden your horizon, and all of that, I think, is inherently positive. But it is not necessarily something that I would want wish for everybody to do because it's mandatory. And the same goes for driving. I'm, I spent some time here in the Nordic area and I spent a lot of time on ferries. Not sure if you've been on a ferry with lots of truck drivers. You know, these are all people that are really suffering from the job that they have. They are super stressed out, you know. They, you, these are not people that worry about something like the work-life balance or so, which at least in some industries, is a luxury thing we can talk about. These are people that are so stressed out 
that they come on the ferry and they will be on the ferry for a few hours and they sit there drinking Red Bull where everybody is wondering why the hell would you drink an energy drink if you're stuck on a ferry but it is because they cannot get out of this stress they know by the time they arrive they w might be too late they might be again catched up in a traffic jam or something like this and there will be somebody waiting and they are the weakest link in this whole chain and they're not even getting paid well for this so what could be better than freeing these people of this kind of a, of a work now I agree some people might be doing this because they like that but I think this is a very small amount of people for which for whom this is a total fulfillment and this is the dream that they've already always wanted to live or so and that's just the part of you know what does this work do to people we're not even speaking about the security of this so I agree we have a problem that it's too easy these days to mess with cars that have a lot of computers built into them but this is a problem I think that will kind of be solved over time at least I'm fairly positive that we will see a technology that is way more advanced than what we see today. But how great would it be if we had a world in which mobility was not, first of all, attached to the fact that I can afford a car, but how great would a world be in which we can think about a flat rate for mobility or so, where no matter where I am, if it's in a city or if it's in the rural area or so, where I can say I need to go from here to there and then whatever kind of a transport vehicle picks me up and brings me where I need to go. And this can be, this can be a 3D printed Ollie by local motors or it can be a VTOL, this, these vertical takeoff and landing things, you know, that are in Dubai 2020. They will have at the World Exhibition, there will be vertical takeoff and landing taxis. They are already being tested. Not sure how many of you grew up with Blade Runner, you know, thinking that this is a, you know, when I saw Blade Runner as a kid, you know, I thought this is so fucking crazy. The fact these 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 uh, flying vehicles, you know, but this is becoming a reality. We will see that. But what does it mean if eight million people in the United States, for example, are working? either driving cars or trucks or working in the environment in the ecosystem of that cooking food for drivers making beds for drivers eight million jobs attached to this one industry that will become more or less obsolete within the next 10 15 maybe 20 years what do we do with all these people in germany we have hard sphere this is the the benefits you can get from the state if you are if you can find a work I, I can tell you it won't scale to the amount of people that suddenly are without work but what is work actually how do we define that I mean how many of you are engaged in projects that are not paid but that are more meaningful than what you do as a paid job now I spend so much time teaching kids programming and soldering with kids and all of that this is so much more meaningful than all the stuff I do that that's getting paid so again similar as thinking back to my childhood this is where I draw some positive idea out of I think I could I could use more time you know I think I could use that time very very well I'd not be rotting on a couch wondering what the purpose of life would be. And I think this is true for most of the people. So what do we have to do? And how do we deal with that? We can't tell 8 million truck drivers. It's very ironic, by the way. Uh, there's, there was a study on medium.com that was dealing with this autonomous uh, driving thing. And they looked at uh, the, the proportion of jobs in the United States. And in most states, the truck driver or the driver in general is the most prominent job it is uh, from a quantity perspective the job with the most numbers something we in Europe I think can't really imagine but a lot of stuff is happening on the street in the US and in most of the states in which this was not the case it's software engineers 
And the, the irony there is that the software engineer is actually working on ridding the world of the truck driver, but there's no forum in which these two sit at a table and talk to one another about how they could go along with this. And I think we can tell truck drivers that, or people working on a construction site that are being replaced by 3D printers, or some other jobs that are going to cease to exist, insurance brokers that suddenly have been replaced by an AI or bankers or whatever, we can't tell these people that they now can become software engineers. You all know that it's, this is not really the way it works. But I think there's a lot of more meaningful things to do. When I left school in 1997, I read a book which was called uh, The Future of Work. And it was uh, a new report put out by the Club of Rome, so one of these old school think tanks. And this was really inspiring because in 1995, when this book was published, they were writing about the fact that, for example, a mother raising their children at home and doing this well is actually doing meaningful work, but why isn't she paid for that? 20 years later, we have not made one step Further, we are still stuck in the same situation as 20 years ago. We have federal elections in Germany this year, and if you look at the party programs, it, everybody says we need full employment. It's not gonna happen. This is something of the past, and if we don't even address the fact, the reality that this is part of the past, then how are we supposed to talk about a plan for the future? And that future is made out of so many amazing things, I'm, and, but also dangerous things. Things that are opening up questions that are so fundamental to us as a society that we need to have this debate. I'm not sure whom of you have heard about CRISPR. Do you know CRISPR, the DNA editing thing? Uh, so I just ordered a two CRISPR kits from the United States. You can. I'm not sure if you know, it's a, it's a DNA editing uh, methodology or so that you can use basically in your basement. It has made editing of DNA and inserting new, uh, new features into DNA. It has, it has made this so easy that this will be addressing serious or bringing up serious, uh, serious challenges in the future of where to draw the line. And there was a NASA engineer who thought that CRISPR is such a nice thing and such an important thing that actually everybody should be able to do these experiments. And then they created the Open Discovery Institute and they made a Kickstarter campaign and now for 150 euros you can order the CRISPR kit and then you can make an experiment at home in your basement or in the kitchen or wherever. And you can take a yeast a piece of yeast and you can make it uh, glow under fluorescent light, for example. You know, or you can take an E. coli bacteria and you can make it immune to one of its natural enemies. This is what's gonna, what's gonna drive a lot of change within our lifetime. This is also digital, because you can now go on lots of different websites that offer some kind of a cloud computing environment that allows you to sequence DNA that allows you to calculate all these things and to make all kinds of things that usually were only accessible to a scientific community or so. Everybody can, everybody can do that these days. And what in five years, ten years or so? This is all digital stuff. This is the fact that, coming back to what I said earlier, the fact that we are reducing the entry level to knowledge so radically with the internet. You know, I'm, I'm a network engineer from where I professionally come from, and to me, net neutrality is was one of the most important concepts of all, and not because I think a phone call should have the same priority as somebody's email or so, but rather because of the more fundamental thing it implies. In a net neutral environment, we are all on eye level. You know, everybody that has access to the internet has the same right to have access to information, has the same right to exchange with everybody else. So if we look at the printing press and how the printing press has reduced the hierarchy, then the internet, to me, is a technology that could be the basis for the first inclusive society. 
a society which is not made of exclusive small clubs where it's only a few privileged people having access to something, but where actually everybody that gets access to the internet is part of an inclusive community, has, part to the has access to the whole wealth of the knowledge that have we have ever discovered as a civilization. And how great could that be? But when do we start discussing these things? When do we, as this community here, find a way how we actually push these topics into the political system, for example, into the public sphere? How do we communicate that? We are really terribly failing this. What I'm, what I'm telling you here, for most of you, probably is not really something new. But we lack a strategy as the people building this new world of how we actually make sure that the winds making the rules, that they actually listen to us, that they actually know about what's coming. There are so many of these very fundamental challenges and we have no idea how to address that. The artificial intelligence field, for example, is yet another of these things. Classically, computers, you know, work as the left side of the brain. Their computers are very good in making mathematical operations, in interpreting symbols, same as if you read a book, you know, you, you read sentences and the computer can do the same thing and it can understand what is there and it can execute something based on that. That's what computers are today. But this is only one half of the brain. The right side of the brain is more for the creative part. It is what, what I reads between the lines rather than along the lines. It interprets things. It has creative features. And there's a whole, there's a whole world of IT that is addressing this right side brain issue. So if you look at IBM, for example, I'm not sure if you heard about True North as uh, a chip that IBM has been researching on for a few years now. This is one of these efforts in order to come up with a technology that can function as the right side of the brain. Something that does not execute a program, but rather creatively learns. If you read up on these chips, I can just recommend that. They are already really scary and very powerful. They don't consume a lot of energy. A single chip, one of these true North chips, it can, it can process around 1500 frames per second. So that's maybe 50 surveillance cameras that one of these chips can already process and learn from these feeds it is getting about what is a car and what is a, a human and what is, what is a, a bike. And it won't understand the meaning of these three things but it can differentiate between them. And it can spot patterns, it can interpret what it is seeing. How long will it take until these chips are getting so small that they're just going to be deployed everywhere, just as all the other stuff that, that we see being introduced at such a rapid speed? This opens up lots of great possibilities. You know, if if Siri or whatever kind of a program you have that is actually trying to understand what you want from it as an agent, if that is not running in the Amazon cloud or in the Google cloud or the, I or the, the Apple cloud anymore, but it is running on your phone and you don't have to necessarily share that with a cloud and an algorithm to interpret what you want, but it's rather a chip that is locally with you that talks to you, that would be a great advantage. But how do we as a society make sure that actually we have some kind of ownership about this? These are all matters of transparency about open source, open hardware, all these concepts that are becoming so increasingly important. Open algorithms, the ability for us to understand what actually is being done and how it is done. But all we kind of, at least to me it seems, all we kind of have managed to how we manage to push the open source debate into the world is a discussion, at least, let's say, if you look at politics or if you look at bureaucracies, is the discussion about if they should buy Microsoft licenses or deploy Linux. You know, this is, that's the open source debate. 
we are having at large in society. It's not a philosophical debate. It's not a debate why transparency and, uh, and the ability to understand things, the ability to also uh, validate things, why these concepts are going to be important for the survival, important as a basis for any kind of a free future at all. How do we do that? I don't really have an answer to that. But what I know is that this community here can change the world. It's all the people here, the people that were at Shah a few weeks back. It's people that go to, you know, I'm, I'm a long time uh, I'm a long time participant in the in the chaos communication congresses in uh, in uh, Germany. We are 12,000 people by now. If these 12,000 people would agree to join together in order to change the world, I think nobody could stop it. But we're kind of trapped somehow. We are trapped with all these little projects that we have and all these these new technologies that we can play with and all kinds of things. And we're kind of, I think, missing this bigger picture that all of this has. And I have no real answer to how we can do this better, but I think that we have to. Because this window of opportunity there, it's going to close. And to me, from where I stand, I think it's going to be basically two choices that we have. It can either be a world where everybody can get a, a, a transplantable organ if they need one, where we all have access to technologies that can free us of work we don't want to do, which can distribute the wealth that we are creating in a completely new way. Or it can be the total opposite. It can be a world in which we see monopolies as today, as Amazon, Google and Apple and maybe two or three others that have become so wealthy and so powerful that it lacks any kind of a comparison in the history of our civilization. It's either going to be one or the other. There's not a lot in between, I think. And I think we should not... I mean, to me, it would be clear what we want. So I hope that's kind of, let's say, that's the takeaway I want to give to you, is that don't forget about this. Don't forget about the responsibility we all have outside of the small projects we are working on when it comes to communicating these things, when it comes to making sure that the rest of the world is not left unthought of. I know how to defend myself, at least to some extent, from monopolies, but it doesn't go for my mother and for most of the other people I know outside of this community. So we must not forget about them. And we must not forget that it is us, it is these, this community, because we are the people that understand that, that has the responsibility to address that, because otherwise I think nobody else will do it. So uh, that said, um, I think time is also running out. Uh, I'm, I thank you for your attention, for coming here rather than spending time somewhere else on the field. And I don't know if you have questions, I'm still around at this large tent there or we can do maybe a few questions until the next speaker is up. So thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of uh, Born Hack. We do have time for questions. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. And I uh, do agree with you that it's a massive, big problem on how do we reach a consensus on organizing and strategizing in participating in this development of technology. And I think that um, an important part of it, of assessing of participating in this development is assessing the effects, both good and bad, that they have on society, theorizing them maybe. Um, but um, the effects are different. The they technology uh, happens in different contexts, in different 
societies at different level of the same society, politics, human relations, uh, and so on. Um, and also, we use concepts that were used in the past, but they keep getting redefined as we speak. So, and I'm not sure that everyone understands the way these concepts are uh, moving or like the dynamics of them in a con in the technological context. Um, for example, we speak, we still talk about consumers in the big data society, when in fact there's a kind of presumption going on mm -hmm. over there and we still have consumers' rights, whereas prosumers' rights would be more important for me to talk about. Now, my question is basically, how can we assess the effects of technological development with concepts that are grounded in history, with the basis that is still relevant, but are uh, constantly changing? Um, presumption is one, identity creation is another. Um, so to kind of get a consensus of how can we strategize further? So the question is how we can organize? Using concepts grounded in history, but changing. Presumption, prosumers yeah. are grounded in something? Well, I don't really have an answer to that. You know, I'm, I'm with this just as, basically just as helpless as everybody else. So um, I think, uh, I mean, we're very far away from speaking about prosumer rights, for example. We don't even have consumer rights that are even adequate, e remotely adequate to uh, the world we are living in. You know, you can still buy a phone or anything else and it has all the terms of service printed in, in caps lock and it's uh, 100 pages long and nobody thought about changing the regulations so that this is not allowed anymore. So I think uh, we, we are very far away from there. But what maybe, uh, maybe to approach this from a different topic, you know, one of the biggest advantages of this time is that with digitization, everything can be copied. And there is no reason why we cannot take uh, things that are good and we can free them from uh, being provided by one of these big monopolies or so. You know, if you... I've been experimenting a little bit with Mastodon, for example. Uh, so there's no reason why we couldn't create an ecosystem of a distributed social network that has all the features that Twitter or any other social media platform has. Uh, and it's just better than that. There's no way why that couldn't happen. The only thing we have to do is move the users and break this network effect that we see. With that, we could create something that is underlying totally new rules without worrying about how to change the old rules to some extent. So I think this is also an opportunity there because we can, we can create new ecosystems. We can learn from what works and what people want and, and what people accept and what they don't accept. And then we can just copy it and into, into a new thing, get rid of all the disadvantages and solve the problem like that. But this also means, Mastodon is a good example again there, that we need to move users and that we need to get out of this, the dark corner where nobody heard of this project. So it's a communication problem again. And it's a bit this problem of the, of the network effect but I think this is something that, that could be done if we just uh, communicate better. If we, uh, if we also educate people better about why they shouldn't stick with a large company that is, um, that is uh, using all of their data. So I know it's not really an answer to your question, but I think we can cr just create new rules. It's none of this is the second law of thermodynamics. You know, nothing in the, in the laws of nature says that Facebook has to have all the data. It's a man-made problem. Oh. Yeah, we're a bit over time, so maybe yeah. we can it's take it. Either just a short uh, question or you can continue later. 
Yeah, it's uh, sort of the same because, I mean, uh, you say we need new solutions, right? But if I look at the old solutions, like, for instance, uh, people uh, in the old days wanted to send a letter uh, that wasn't snapped by the king, right? Yeah. Uh, they made uh, uh, solidarity, they made trade unions. Um, so, I mean, as I see the first uh, industrial revolution, uh, it moved peasants uh, to the city and such, right? And they, they had some, uh, some solutions, a, a, a modernist uh, trade union, uh, the peasants had uh, liberalism and so forth. And what I don't understand when I uh, also talk to politicians is that everybody said we need a new solution. But I would just prefer that they keep their old solutions so that, for instance, if they're from a liberal party, then they don't want emails to be snapped up. And here I actually think Germany is a lot better than Denmark. Uh, but why don't yeah. people uh, look at the old solutions and then just maybe try to twist it or so? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I agree. Uh, some of these old solutions could probably adapted, be adapted to uh, the new reality or so. But I'm not sure if that goes for everything that is coming our way. And I think uh, actually some of... Um, there, there were some efforts in Germany where we were trying to adapt the uh, Telemedien Gesetz, so the, uh, the, the law about uh, media, to new media or so, and it doesn't really work. So... Um, I agree. You you can you can uh, get some some insight from there, and you can draw some inspiration from there. But I would at least I would prefer if we if for some parts we spoke about uh, you know a green field rather than brown field, which we are trying to you know to adapt to this new stu new stuff. But it's all it's it's basically it's the same all over again. I agree. And, and there's a lot of lessons to learn, but that requires that you understand a new thing, and that doesn't really happen very often. So, okay, so I think time is up, and yeah. um, I, I'll still be around. I mean, you find me on the campsite if you want to discuss. Yeah? Thanks, and uh, have a nice camp. Thanks a lot.